going to echo what Ken said in that um, really enjoyed. I want to thank the choir for that beautiful anthem and as well as my soul. I had come from Castingo campus, uh, obviously from the services earlier, and was standing, I got here, hurried over, got, was standing right behind the door when that anthem started. And when you're going between campuses on a morning like this, you're, you're kind of in a hurry, there's some stress to it, and so I'm switching my mic out and taking my coat off, I'm standing behind the door, and the song starts, the, the anthem starts, and it was just, just stop and, and listen. <sighs> Thank you, it was well worth it, my soul. How many of you grew up with Sesame Street in your home? Either you watched it, you had a kid who watched it, maybe multiple kids who watched it. Well, do you know Sesame Street first aired in July of 1969? Wow. A survey was done uh, some years after that, in 1996, that found that 95% of American preschoolers had watched the show by the time they were three years old. 95%, which means... Multiple generations of American children grew up with beloved characters like Big Bird. Any Big Bird fans? Or how about Cookie Monster? Cookies. I'm sorry if I just put a craving for cookies in your mind. Bert and Ernie? I think Bert and Ernie were my favorite. Uh, or Kermit and Miss Piggy. But one of the most popular, or at least one of the little, little segments that I used to like, even when my boys were little, was the little segment called One of These Things is Not Like the Other. You remember that? Okay, so we're going to actually play. All right, so one of these things is not like the other. Can you shout out which one's not like the other? Okay, how about this one? Capital R. Uh, and, of course, this one? Got it? And I have just one more for you. It's the, the really good-looking one, right, that's, that's different. <laughs> Today we're going to look at two things in God's Word that just don't seem to go together. They are grace and suffering. Grace and suffering. Last week, Pastor Jeff asked us to fill out uh, a list and to write down a list of things that where we saw God's grace in our lives. Remember that from last week? Write it in the bulletin. How many of you did that last week? Remember having that? Well, I kept mine. And as I was working through this message, I realized, I thought, how many of us on that list included something that involved pain or suffering? We're in a series right now called Uncomfortable Grace. We're almost toward the end of it. And we've learned that the basic meaning of grace is gift. Because grace is the gift of God in Jesus Christ. The gift of forgiveness, the gift of new life, the gift of hope. Grace is that which we don't deserve and cannot earn. Grace is the good news of the gospel. But we've also learned that properly understood, grace is also uncomfortable. Because to experience grace, we must admit that we need grace, and we don't like to admit that we need grace. To share with others means we have to get close enough to them, close enough to their brokenness, so they can experience grace. We've learned that grace takes us to places sometimes we'd rather not go. Jeff has quoted a pastor named Paul David Tripp several times in what he calls the theology of uncomfortable grace. God will take you where you haven't intended to go in order to produce in you what you could not achieve on your own. Last week we saw how grace leads us toward greater and greater generosity. And today we talk about grace and suffering. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and let me just give you a little background once again. Uh, Paul is writing a letter, something, this is a combination of two letters, but he's writing to a church in ancient Corinth, which is today in modern day Greece. Uh, Paul had founded this church several years earlier, had spent 18 months with them, teaching, loving them, teaching them the life of Christ and the power of the gospel, and a church had formed. Then Paul had moved on. Uh, maybe to the city of Ephesus to start a church there. And in his absence, this young church experienced all kinds of difficulties and conflicts. And he's writing them to try to help them through these issues. And one of the issues that came up, among many, was a faction of people who were highly critical of Paul himself because he was no longer there. And they were trying to discredit him, and they were even preaching a gospel Paul regarded as a false gospel. So one of the things he's doing in this letter is trying to reestablish his authority as an apostle as one who can teach the truth about Christ, who had learned from Christ himself. And in the process, 
he gets into this topic of suffering and grace. 2 Corinthians 12, I'm going to begin in verse 7. Paul writes, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, we'll talk about those in a moment, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. First thing Paul talks about here is what I'm calling today a thorny gift. A thorny gift. Those of you who have been around church for a while and have known me over the years know that I struggled with hip pain for many years. I was an athlete in my younger years and some 20 years of playing basketball every day, running up and down, jumping, bad shoes, hard surfaces, simply wore out my hip joints. By the time I was in my mid-30s, I was still playing ball in local church leagues with guys like Doug Walton and Mike Creel, I don't know if he's here, uh, Steve Luby, we were still playing ball, but I would wake up in the middle of the night with shooting pain going down my left leg. I knew something was wrong, so I went to see an orthopedic specialist, he took an x-ray, and then he delivered the bad news. He told me I had the hips of a very old man, I had bone on bone on both sides, and I would never run or play ball again. And so, for the next 20 years or so, I learned to live with degenerative arthritis in both hips. I switched from running and playing ball, basketball to riding a bike for exercise. Boring. <laughs> I walked with a limp that grew more and more pronounced. Many of you watched it over the years until it actually became difficult for me to stand here and preach for 30 minutes. I sometimes told people it felt like I had ice picks stuck in both hip sockets. When I mentioned I could no longer bend over far enough to pick up my morning paper, I was using kitchen tongs. Some thoughtful church members gave me some gifts. <laughs> I actually got three different versions of this given to me so I could pick up stuff without having to bend over. I could reach for my chips without having to get out of the... <laughs> Very thoughtful. And then finally, when I had to walk with a cane, just to walk, I knew uh, the time had come. So last summer, I had both my hips replaced within nine weeks of each other. And during my recovery... Uh, I found myself thinking about lots of things. And the first thing I thought about was, was gratitude. How grateful I was for successful hip surgery. That they could do that. Just put new joints in your body and relieve you of pain. It was amazing. And if I had been keeping a list then of evidence of God's grace in my life, I'd have put right at the top of the list successful hip replacement surgery. But then I kept thinking about it. And I started to realize there was a deeper level of grace going on. For example, I realized through that journey that God had taught me more than I ever thought I would learn about chronic pain and what that does to people. It made me more sensitive to others, so many who experience chronic pain. During the couple of months that I had to use a cane to walk, I, I learned something about what it's like to be handicapped, to see how people look at you and how they treat you. Uh, I learned about humility and love. With the, So many of you would ask me how I was doing and would send me uh, names of surgeons and would give me uh, remedies and would give me thoughtful gifts and would send me notes about your prayers. Now, I'm not saying that my pain was anything like what the Apostle Paul is going to talk about or anything about what you're dealing with today. But I do know this. I can see that God took me where I did not intend to go or want to go. I would never have chosen arthritic hips for myself in order to produce what I could not achieve on my own. It's the uncomfortable grace is grace in suffering. Paul says, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Now what's Paul talking about here? Most of you know the basic outline of Paul's story, how he began as Saul of Tarsus, who was a powerful, uh, hate-filled, vindictive man who devoted to arresting, persecuting, and if need be, killing followers of Jesus Christ, who then had a transformative experience, confronted by Christ on the road to Damascus, turned him inside out, and Saul of Tarsus became Paul the Apostle. And then we find out 
from other places in Scripture that Paul received a series of revelations from the Lord himself. Earlier in this, this same chapter, he says, I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ, here he's talking about himself, who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. In other words, he's reestablishing his authority. He's saying, I, Paul, learned from Jesus himself how to lead and teach you the truth. So listen to me. But he's also saying, I, above all others, have reasons to be spiritually proud. I've had the most unique experience any man could ever have. And Paul knew his own tendency toward pride. So he says, to keep me from becoming conceited, a thorn was given me in the flesh. Now, notice he says, a thorn was given me. He's saying in some way that thorn is a gift. Now, the Greek word translated in English as thorn actually refers to something bigger than like a, a thorn on a rose bush. It's more of a, a shiv, like a wooden pointed uh, stick, like a stake. Paul's speaking metaphorically, not of having like a little splinter in his toe, but having a, a stake driven through his heart. It's that painful. So the question is, what was Paul's thorn? What's he talking about? Well, we don't really know. We can just guess. There are all kinds of scholarly guesses. Some think maybe malaria. He traveled all over the world. Maybe he contracted disease that was bothering him, fevers and so forth. Some think maybe it was uh, migraine headaches. Some of you may struggle with migraines. You know they can be debilitating. Some think maybe it was uh, bad eyesight. We know he struggled with eyesight at some certain points in Scripture. You can tell maybe he was struggling with that. Many think he was simply referring to personal enemies, like those in Corinth who were trying to destroy his reputation, who hated him. Maybe his thorn in the flesh was people. We don't really know. We just know it was significantly painful. And then he refers to his thorn as a messenger of Satan to harass me. Now what's that about? How can a thorn be both a gift of God and a messenger of Satan? To understand, we have to go back to the great book of Job in the Old Testament. What I believe is one of the most important and least read books in the entire Bible. Basic outline of the story of Job. Job's a righteous man, honors and worships God. He's blameless, wealthy beyond imagination, has a huge, large, loving family. And then we read this mysterious paragraph. Job chapter 1. Verse 6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth, from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed his, the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. In other words, you've made him wealthy. You've made him rich. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, this is a strange and difficult but hugely important part of the biblical story. We must try to understand to understand what Paul is teaching us. The Bible teaches us that Satan is real. There's so much about Satan's activity that we do not understand. We don't have access to throughout God's Word. But we do know that Satan is the enemy of God. Satan hates Jesus Christ. He hates the Holy Spirit. And if you are a follower of Christ today, he hates you too. And he's trying to destroy you. Satan roams the earth. In the story uh, of Job, Satan accuses Job of worshiping and honoring God only for what he gets from him. Only because he gets wealth from God. And then he challenges God and says, you take away his stuff. You take away all his blessings and he'll curse you to your face just like all human beings. Because they don't love you for you. They love you for what you give them. And then God grants Satan limited freedom to inflict pain and suffering in Job's life. And here's what we have to understand. Satan is under the authority, the absolute authority of God. God is sovereign. Yet he grants Satan a limited freedom to wreak havoc in the world. One day we know from the end of the story 
book of Revelation, that Christ is going to destroy his enemy once and for all, for all eternity. But that day is not here yet. So Satan's strategy is to destroy, to inflict pain and suffering on an innocent man to watch as his trust and love for God is shattered. And I believe that's still his strategy today. And my guess would be some of you are dealing with those attacks even right now. Because he believes he can destroy your relationship with God. But his strategy doesn't work on Job if you read the story. In fact, it backfires big time because Job refuses to curse God. He remains steadfast in faith. And so God, at the end of the story, reveals himself in all his power and glory to Job. And the great theme of the book of Job and the great theme of the entire biblical story is redemption. That is God buying back purchasing, redeeming the brokenness and sin of the world through the suffering of his own son. That's why Paul can say in Romans chapter 8, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Paul is saying he received a thorny gift, a thorn intended to bring pain and discouragement, which is the work of Satan himself. But God turned that thorn into a gift. A thorny gift. Secondly, we see in this passage a sufficient grace. A sufficient grace. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I went to uh, a family reunion in Tennessee, took a little vacation. There was a family wedding and so forth. After all that, we went with um, my wife's twin sister and her husband, my brother-in-law, down for two days. It's a little two-day getaway south to Panama City Beach, Florida. We found, did it spur of the moment, found online uh, rented a, con- a condo down there. It happened to be on the 22nd floor of a high-rise condominium building right on the beach. It was really nice, just two nights. And w- the first night we were there, I was looking... No, go, back- go backwards. Just keep it right there for a second. The, fir- the first night we were there, uh, I looked out the window from the balcony into the darkness. It was like 10.30 at night. It was dark. And I saw these flashlights bobbing up and down on the beach. People were down there with flashlights. I said to my brother-in-law, what are they doing? What are they doing on the beach? He said, they're looking for sand crabs. I have no idea why, but they were looking for sand crabs. Now, I know nothing about sand crabs. This is Mr. Sand Crab, okay? He's going to be our, the, the character in our story right now. But I got to thinking about sand crabs a little bit as I worked on this message for some reason. I thought, let's, Im- let's imagine Mr. Sand Crab, sooner or later, crawls out of the sand, and he wants to go into the ocean. Oh, go back to Mr. Sand Crab. Did we lose him? There he is. And, and from his perspective, he's right down on the sand. His perspective, he's looking at the, at the sea, and all he can see is the front edge of the waves coming in. So he's looking, he's thinking, oh, I hope I can get there. I hope there's enough for me. I hope there's enough water that I can, that I can swim in. I hope. So all he can see is the, like the sea foam right on the edge. Because he's, he's, that's his perspective. But I'm not a sand crab. I'm up on the 22nd floor of a condominium. I'm looking like this. I can see the sea stretching all the way to the horizon. So if I had a chance to talk to Mr. Sand Crab, what would I say? I would say, relax, buddy. There's enough. Trust me. There's enough for you. But he said, but I can't see. I can't see. I can only see. I, can't. I would say, well, I'd give him a wider perspective. Put the next one up. And I'd say, there's enough. There's enough for you. I think that's something about what Paul is teaching us here. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Now, before we talk about grace... I want to talk just a little bit about prayer. There's a couple of lessons here for us, I think, tucked away. First, I think we see persevering prayer. Paul writes, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this. Now, by the way, I think this is the only place in the New Testament, Paul wrote most of our New Testament, I think this is the only place where he asked to be relieved from a difficult situation. In almost every other case, he doesn't ask to be released from prison. He asks for more boldness and courage to bear witness in prison. But this time, he asked for relief because this is bad. It's painful. It's difficult for him. The word pleaded means to beg, to implore, to beseech. This is intense, personal, pain-filled prayer. And I wonder, have you ever prayed like that? Have you ever pleaded with God in prayer? Have you ever persevered in prayer? Maybe for an illness, a sickness, Maybe for a loved one going through a deep personal pain. If you're a parent today, I don't care how old your children are, I know you've prayed like this. Because it's what parents do. My guess is most of you 
know what it is to pray like this so you understand what Paul's talking about. But secondly, we see then what I would call the mystery of unanswered prayer from our perspective. Paul prays repeatedly, three times. He pleads with the Lord. His request is totally understandable. It's reasonable. And yet, his request is not granted. Not at least not in the way he asks. Now, we know from other parts of Scripture that our prayers will go unanswered or unheard if we pray with selfish motives, if we pray for that which is contrary to God's will or God's word, if we pray while consciously disobeying God as a area of our lives. But none of those are true for Paul. Still, God does not remove his thorn. I've had the privilege over the years of praying with many, many people, many of you. Often, most often in cases and times of, of pain and struggle. Some have experienced relief and help, even healing. Many, many have not. So how are we to understand what from our perspective is unanswered prayer? Look at how, what Paul understood. Paul understood it like this. He believed God had a greater purpose in mind for his pain. God had a purpose in his pain. Third thing we see here is what I call listening prayer. And we can almost miss this. Notice Paul says, but he said to me. So when Paul's praying, it's not a monologue. It's not just him telling God everything he needs and asking for stuff. He's actually in a conversation. He's listening. Okay, it's a, it's a two-way thing. One of my favorite ways to describe prayer is that prayer is like wrestling in the dark until you feel God wrestle back. It's like wrestling in the dark until you feel him wrestle back. Like Jacob wrestling with the stranger in Genesis 32, later realizing it's God. I will not let you go until you bless me. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Jesus in the garden, let this cup pass from me. Paul here wrestles and wrestles and wrestles in prayer until Jesus wrestles back. And he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, the language here is beautiful. The Greek word order literally is sufficient for you is the grace of me. Sufficient for you is the grace of me. Now, how is grace sufficient when you have a thorn stuck in your flesh, a stake driven through your heart? Well, first, grace is sufficient because when Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, speaks to you, he brings with him comfort and peace. And encouragement. So prayer itself becomes the conduit by which we receive the comforting presence of Christ himself. Secondly, grace is sufficient because it's the gospel and the gospel brings hope. Because things will not always be as they are. God promises to redeem all things. And that hope comes back into our circumstance and helps us to endure. And thirdly, grace is sufficient because it's the power of Christ to transform our pain into something greater. And we'll get there in just a moment. So Paul is experiencing some sort of excruciating pain. He begs three times for God to remove it from his life. And then Jesus finally speaks and says, sufficient for you is the grace of me. Which allows Paul later, in writing to the Ephesians, to pen this beautiful paragraph. Listen to it in the context of suffering. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people listen, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul's talking to us like we're sand crabs. Like, we can only see this much. We can only see the edge. And he's much higher. He's saying, oh, there's enough. There's so much grace. It's sufficient for you. And the third thing we see in this text is a perfect power. Paul writes, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's a temptation when we read a verse like this, when I read it, and I know it's a Bible verse, and what we're supposed to do is sort of nod, hmm, deep, that's good, that's good. 
But it's all wrong. It's all backwards, isn't it? I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses. I am content with weakness, insults, and calamities. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. It's all backwards. Our culture teaches exactly the opposite. It's the strong who survive. It's the weak who fail. Hide your weaknesses. Deny your weaknesses. Be as strong as you can. What's Paul talking about? Well, we know here that Paul is toward the end of his life. Don't know exactly how close he is to it, but he's toward the, the latter part of his earthly life. He's done a lot. He's seen a lot. He knows now what we all try to ignore and avoid. That is, the world is a broken place, terribly broken. See Charlottesville. He also knows that he is broken and has been. He spent decades living out of his own strength, his own power, and that turned him into a pride-filled, rage-filled, arrogant, and murderous tyrant, a man who was dead inside, spiritually speaking. Now he's been living with Christ, preaching the gospel for some 20 years, and he's experienced the violence and darkness of the world himself. He's been arrested, beaten with rods. He's been stoned and left for dead. He's been shipwrecked and snake bit and on and on and on. And he knows now that the only hope of his life, the only hope for the world, is the grace of Christ. He knows that the strength of his life, the only strength of his life, the power of his life, is his weakness surrendered to the power of Christ. He knows that even his worst pain, the thorn in his flesh, when surrendered to Christ, will inevitably produce glory and goodness. On July 30th, 1967, two years before Sesame Street first aired, a 17-year-old girl on summer vacation dove headfirst into the cloudy waters of Chesapeake Bay. But the water was much shallower than she thought, she struck her head on the bottom, sustained a catastrophic spinal cord injury. It left her paralyzed from the shoulders down. Many of you know who that was. That 17-year-old was Johnny Erickson. She became a quadriplegic that day, confined to a wheelchair for the rest of her life. In her own words, she writes, I hated my paralysis so much, I would drive my power wheelchair into walls, trying to hurt myself. I found dark companions who helped me numb my depression with scotch and cola. I just wanted to die. But then Johnny says during those days, a trusted friend shared words with her that set the course for her life. The trusted friend said, God permits what he hates to accomplish what he loves. God permits what he hates to accomplish what he loves. She then says, I began to see there are more important things in life than walking and using your hands. It sounds incredible, but I really would rather be in this wheelchair knowing Jesus as I do than being on my feet without him. This past July 30th was the 50th anniversary of her accident. And that's where I found some of her blogging and writings, her devotionals. It was on that anniversary. Today she's one of the most influential authors, speakers, and artists in the Christian world. Last week, Pastor Jeff quoted Tim Keller when he said, there can be no significant spiritual growth or maturity until you put your money and your attitude toward money in God's hands. And I think that's true when it comes to generosity. Today, I think we could say this, and this is just me talking. There can be no genuine spiritual growth or maturity until we put our suffering and our attitude toward our suffering in God's hands. So, what's your thorn today? What's the great pain of your heart today? There's no way I can possibly know what those are. But I know they're there. There's no way you can know what's, what mine is, but it's there. And I do know this. There is grace for your thorn. There is grace in your pain. So offer it to him in prayer. Plead. Persist. Wrestle. And listen. Because sooner or later, he'll say to you what he said to the Apostle Paul. Sufficient for you is the grace of me. Let's bow as we close. Lord, how we thank you today for your word. This is not easy stuff. It wasn't for Paul. It's not for us. But it's so important. Pain is real. 
Thorns hurt. We have an enemy who wants to destroy and discourage. Remind us through your word, through the honesty of Paul himself, that your grace is deep, your grace is wide, your grace is sufficient, and there is enough. It's in your name that we pray.